is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Ascend, the third book in the Children of Divinity series, chapters one, two, and three. In these chapters, we get an answer to a question that I don't enjoy having, but I had it anyway, which was, where's Briar Young? And it turns out where he is sucks, and I love it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Heather for commissioning this episode. Heather is here in the chat and it's a birthday Monday. Happy birthday. So <laughs> there is so much that has happened since the last book ended. I think I kind of expected this book to start where the last one ended and that we were going to like see the recruitment process that they had to go through to get people on their side and everything. And that really isn't what we're jumping into it all, things have sort of moved on and been resolved into the separate groups that we were heading towards already by the time we begin. And I have to be honest, I'm glad of that. I kind of prefer this to what I was thinking was going. And it, it's not even like I was dreading what I had thought was coming at all. But it's that sort of thing where you just have like a preconceived notion of the flow of things. And it's nice to be surprised and it's nice to sidestep some things that might feel, I don't want to say like a little bit too predictable, but just sometimes, you know, there'll be a conversation with a couple characters and it's like, Ooh, can she convince them to join them? And based on the relationships that people have had, you're like, no, I know she will. So I don't really want to sit through this and watch them argue about it. Unless it's people that I genuinely am not sure. And if I'm not sure, probably she shouldn't even be approaching them. So, you know, um, I was actually talking about this with something else that I was covering the other day. But just watching characters argue about something is not as interesting as certain writers tend to think it is. Unless they both have a really good point of view and unless you really care about both characters and are sort of like rooting for each of them in their own way otherwise it's just a drag so i just like you know <laughs> heather in the chat says logistics aren't as much fun to read about heather i cannot agree with that sentence i'm you know me in logistics i am into it so it's not even that it's just more like when you're like, I know how this is going to end up and I just sort of have to sit through it until we get there. Do you know what I mean? It, that's sort of energy. Um, and yeah, we don't have to do any of that and it's great. But what we do start off with is hugely annoying. And I don't mean like in terms of, you know, the writing or anything. I just mean, I am realizing what gets to me about Jill. So we start off with Jill in the midst of a mission and it's like granted a pretty small mission, but I'll be honest, I was sort of hoping that this was like a training exercise that just seemed really real because Jill is so irresponsible here. And it's the kind of thing where like you just have to accept that certain people's minds work totally differently from your own. And this is something that I have a lot of trouble with because for me, I like to think, as I'm sure most people do, but I like to think that I can be pretty objective and manage to use logic in situations and see both points of view and come to a reasonable conclusion. And that sort of like feeling of like, well, my process for deciding things makes sense. And because it makes sense, that must be how everyone does it, you know? But if everybody thought like me, 
absolutely nothing would fucking get done. Like, I'm not even talking about like, oh, I'm not good at math or I'm, you know, I'm just talking about like, I am a cautious person in a lot of ways, um, which I think some people might find funny for me to say, because I can be extremely outgoing or outspoken or daring with like how I dress. But when I'm taking action, especially when there's like a real physical danger, I don't like to play with that. That really scares me. And I am going to be extremely circumspect about every step of the way um, to the point where it's not great. You know, like um, I'm covering Cradle, the book series and another one. And there's a point at which this girl is attempting to break through to a new level of power. And some somebody says to her, you have to learn by walking. You can't just take a step and then stop and evaluate how that step went before you take the next step. And I felt like I had been shot because that is just an, a completely accurate pinpoint precision kind of, what's the word I want? Criticism, I guess. Accusation is more what it felt like uh, in terms of how I think. And Jill is just so not like that. And because she's not, I find her just so frustrating to read because I'm like, what are you thinking? And granted, she comes to the correct conclusion in the end. You know, she gets yelled at, um, which I honestly appreciate. Douglas is like, I shouldn't be yelling at you for every mistake you make. And I'm like, okay, you shouldn't be yelling at her for every mistake. But she was like, grinning after you had to completely sideline what was going on to rescue her. She deserved to be yelled at because she still clearly did not understand the gravity of what she had just done and was willing to just like, she was about to sort of dance by it and just be like, well, it worked out. And that's the kind of thing that like, it's not just people who are less cautious. That's a real youthful sort of attitude to be like, well, it worked out this time, so probably it will always work out. Instead of, well, it worked out this time, thank God for that, better not test fate and try again, which is what you start to think as you get older, you know? And um, just the fact that it stems from her like completely disregarding a direct order that she's given. And yet, she's over here obviously trying to channel Jordan a little bit. And I appreciate that as well, that Douglas zeroes in on that and is like, hey, look, I understand that you kind of want to be your sister because she's an insane badass, but guess what? Nobody is really like your sister. And you don't have to be. What you need to bring to the table is who you are. And just don't like attempt to approach things the way she approaches things when she has a completely different power and skill set to you. That doesn't make sense. Like, why would you handle it that way? And yeah, I just really appreciated that because look, I am sure that from the outside compared to, <laughs> this is one of those things that happens, but Jordan has just recently broken out of like the the group that she was assigned to low-key like committing a little bit of treason light treason maybe less than light but you know um and is breaking a lot of rules and i could see somebody young interpreting this as well breaking rules is how you get things done but the truth of it is Jordan got to the point of breaking rules like this after following them all her life to the point that she became hyper competent, the kind of competence that even amongst other superpowered beings is rare. So I think that gets sort of overlooked a lot by people who are either inexperienced and that can be due to youth, or it could simply be because they're new to whatever, and due to people who are a little bit lazy and want to sidestep the hard work, and they think that just sort of ignoring the commonly held wisdom about how to do things 
is somehow them be having more vision, you know, being able to see that like, yeah, they're telling me to do this, but they don't get what I'm actually capable of, or they don't see the big picture kind of thing. And it's just, it's not reality most of the time. You know, I feel like we do a lot of like kids in some ways a disservice by we have so much like in our literature and our media, movies, whatever, about kids who are growing up in a certain society with certain like accepted restrictions or ideals or cultural rituals and how those kids sort of rebel against that. And while I think a lot of that is due to Americans really valuing individuality over, you know, cultures that are about the group experience and loyalty and watching out for one another. And there is nothing wrong with valuing individuality. I think it does send a message that like, if you don't think like everyone else, it means that you're smarter than them, or maybe better at this than them. And that's when you start to get into this dangerous territory, where it starts to become what it has been in recent years, which is, if I'm an asshole, it's just because people don't understand my genius, which has unfortunately been like sort of a thing lately in a lot of our more popular movies and television shows. And I feel like it's finally starting to get called out. But I feel like a lot of the damage has been done, you know? So anyway, I'm not trying to say that Jill really thinks that she's smarter than everybody else, but I think she's misunderstanding where Jordan's skill comes from and where, like, what makes Jordan so good at her job. And disobeying orders in the midst of an attack when she's new to this is not how that works. Jordan wasn't welcomed into this group when she started. Not that it's this group, because she broke off and started her own, like, splinter group. But she just basically, like, took her hits because she knew she had to and continued to excel and excel and excel, despite the fact that they kept purposely trying to put roadblocks up in front of her over and over again. And that isn't something that Jill actually got to see. The first time Jill saw her sister doing shit, it was that crazy fight in the middle of the city up against these half shark men. So that's what she saw. And that's what she's trying to do. And it's too soon. And it's also like, just so dangerous for everyone else on her team. And that is the part that got me the most angry here. Because as somebody who is always so aware of how things are going to affect people around me to the point that I'm like sweating, trying to put my change back in my wallet before the customer behind me in line gets mad at me. That's how over fucking like aware I am. I can't even imagine being sort of new to the scene, disobeying a direct order given to me by two people and just like even if she were alone out there and then doing it in such a way where somebody else might have to like jump in and rescue you so they could potentially be put at risk as well. And she misses her jump. She tries to like jump and hit this fire escape and she doesn't even reach it. She hits it, bashes into it and then starts plummeting towards the ground. And because she can heal, like this starts with her getting shot it's really clear that she thinks that she's invincible in a way that doesn't take into account all of the circumstantial stuff that could happen. And that's what Douglas points out because she's like, if I hit the ground and broke my bones, I would just fix my bones. It wouldn't be a problem. He's like, but what if we had other baddies down there and you're just laying there with a bunch of broken bones and they come at you while you're still broken, then what? And she has to stop and just be like, all right, I didn't think of that. And he's like, mm, oh, you don't say. You didn't think about it? It's just crazy because I couldn't tell. So I appreciated him yelling at her. I don't think he was out of line at all. I think he, she, he needed to say it the way that he said it because she was not hearing him. Like the way that conversation was going, it just felt like it was bouncing off her. There is nothing like that frustration of really like wanting somebody to 
absorb the impact of what you're saying and it feeling like they're barely even hearing you. So I just really felt for him that he sort of winds up going for the jugular in the end because she's clearly, like I said, she starts smiling at him because of how impressive the rescue was. And I'm just like, girl, do you not think about how, yeah, it was impressive because he had to do something kind of bonkers and dangerous for him. And that isn't something that you should be proud of forcing him into. No, she doesn't seem to think of that. Like he has to really get at her about it. And she finally stops and is like, you're right. All right. Yeah, I know you're right. And I was very relieved. And I was also glad that she says she's not going to make the same mistake again. And he says, I know you are a quick learner. I'll give you that. That was also encouraging, you know, because it's one thing to in the moment be like chastised and really think, okay, maybe I don't know everything. But then you get put in another situation like that and you can convince yourself this isn't really the same situation. You know what I mean? You can just be like, well, I mean, that was then and this is now. The past is the past. So I'm hopeful that that's like genuine and that she really will kind of reconsider that sort of thing in, in the future. Granted, there may be a day where she does have to disobey a direct order and it will be for the good, but I don't trust her judgment on that yet. Um, so that's the end of the that conversation or that like scene with the two of them. Um, oh, and I wanted to mention, Heather, and I don't know if this is something that can be updated or not, but the table of contents for this Kindle book does not have any of the chapters. It just is covered table of contents and beginning, and that's it. So it, it's a little hard for me to navigate, and um, I don't know if that was like purposeful or not, but I just wanted to mention it in case it's something. I don't know how uploading files to Amazon like works anymore because I used to do this, but it was at least 10 years ago now. So I'm sure that technology is different. And if it's as much of a pain to update that as it used to be, don't worry about it. <laughs> but I just wanted to mention it. Um, so, okay, then we go to chapter two and Jordan is being followed. And this is really fun because as it turns out, it's her dad. But initially, she isn't like, she's just noticing that this guy's really good at it. And there's a point at which he changes his gait and I think turns his hoodie inside out. His hoodie is a different color at one point. And I don't know if that's like he has another hoodie on him or he has some sort of ability to like give illusion that his hoodie's a different color or that he, it's like, you know, one that has a different color on the inside and outside. But regardless, he is capable enough at not only changing up the way that he looks so that if somebody was less skilled than she is, they would not realize it was the same person. But also, she really tries to give him the slip hard a couple times. And it does not work. He is still there. Like, it takes a minute. But she looks over her shoulder eventually and he's like still there. Excuse me. So she ducks into an alley at one point and makes herself invisible. I keep forgetting that she can do that. And then all of a sudden she smells this familiar scent and like her guard drops. And I really was like, who, who is it that she would know well enough to know their scent? And then when it's her dad, I was like, oh my God. Yeah, that makes total sense. The whole idea of being able to like detect interesting different scents is something that I really enjoy in stories like this. And it's so hard for me to imagine because I have a really good sense of smell actually in life, like just as a person, because I think that's what makes me a really good cook. Um, and honestly, it's not awesome sometimes, you know, I, it, it can be hard for me to like get comfortable chilling on the couch or in bed when I can smell that like the cat just took a massive horrible shit out in the living room and it's like I can smell it and I'll be like oh my god and Owen has no idea what I'm talking about so in that respect I'm always just kind of like man this must kind of suck sometimes but on the other hand 
it being so heavy on information would be really cool. You know, like being able to come onto a scene and be like, all right, well, so-and-so was here and they were kind of mad or they cooked this or whatever. I think it's a really neat idea. I just wonder if it's ever like kind of a, <laughs> if there's ever a sense of almost pain with it, you know, because like, that's a thing. Human beings, we have like a pain receptor sort of sense in our noses that we'll smell something and recoil. And it's this automatic like reaction. And you don't see that as much with super powered smelling. You don't see them always being like, Ugh, unless it's meant to be a specific joke or it's meant to be like, you know, in Twilight, how vampires smell horrible to werewolves and vice versa. Um, but anyway, so yeah, it's her dad and he has been following her and she is trying to get to the uh, the safe house that she has set up for her people. And um, she just leads him in and they wind up having this conversation. So first of all, he, she, like, he immediately starts off with, I'm not letting you kill McIntyre. And she's like, oh, let me. Really? That's how we're going to play this. Okay. If that's how you want to do it. And he says something about how he has more experience than her. And I thought this was something that he was about to like, because I, I thought he already knew that she had been told the truth. Apparently he did not know. So <laughs> what winds up happening is Jordan absolutely unleashes on him about the fact that he kept this secret. And like, he says something about how I see now it was a bad idea. And she's like, you see now, now 30 something years down the line. Like really? I don't remember how old she is the oldest, but I don't remember how old she is. She's not 30 though. Is she, she's like 26 or something. Right. Um, and he, you know, does the, I just wanted you to have a normal life kind of thing. And she's like, <sighs> okay, here's the thing. We weren't normal though. And we were hyper aware of the fact that we weren't normal. And so we had to go through our lives in these sort of high stress constant emotional states because we were hiding ourselves. We were worrying about hurting people around us. We were baffled by the things that we could do that we didn't know about. Shit just began to pop up and we thought, oh, okay, I guess my powers, I can become invisible. Oh, nope. It's also that I'm super strong. Oh, nope. I can also hyper smell. Like, and honestly, this bitch is completely 100% correct and he should be ashamed of himself. And he just sort of lets her yell at him. But I like how it said that him contritely sitting there and letting her yell like doesn't help at all and that is really like when you're mad at somebody any any response that they give is never gonna like feel good they can argue with you and that will sort of help in terms of you wanting to continue to escalate because you are so mad but it will make you more angry with them because it feels like they're trying to defend something indefensible they can meekly accept that you are correct in whatever you're saying, which doesn't help because it feels like, well, if you can tell I'm right, why didn't you come to this conclusion yourself and not put me in this position? Or they can continue to justify things in which it feels like they are not taking responsibility for it. They are gaslighting you at times. It's just when you're this mad at someone and you really have like a good reason behind it. There is no response from that person that is going to be satisfactory. There just won't. And like, th th this is one of the most frustrating parts of like, you know how in you're in the shower and you're thinking about what you should have said to somebody in a, mo a given moment, you know, laying in bed and almost asleep and you realize like, Oh my God, I should have thrown X, Y, Z in their face. And in those little fantasies that always goes a certain way, the person clams up because you really put them in their place 
or they suddenly realize they were wrong and they're contrite and whatever. There's always a resolution that we assign to whatever we would have said that we're like, I, if only I could have gotten that perfect happy ending. And in reality, if you had said the thing in the moment, probably it would have just caused things to sort of explode. We want to believe it wouldn't, or that it at least would have been satisfying, even if it would cause things to explode. And the truth is like, if somebody has been able to hurt you that badly already, that's because you like care about them usually in a way that makes it so that these things have extra weight and it's not neat and tidy and there isn't a way to resolve it that feels like it's over, you know, and concluded with any sort of real closure to it. So this scene, you know, he's like, he, first of all, he drops that McIntyre is one of them. And she's like, oh, oh, okay, cool. Another secret. This is really neat. I love not knowing things and finding out you have yet more shit to tell me that you haven't told me. And this like leads to him telling her about the way things started on planet earth. And he gives her a way more detailed description because we've had like, you know, the, the vague outlines of the fact that the, um, Incarna were this, the human beings were sort of a backup of their like less evolved, I guess. Uh, their race, but we didn't really find out about what motivated them to do this. And it turns out that it's like a religious thing. And when I say religious, I don't think that he would necessarily agree with that wording because for them, they, they are really accepting of the fact that there is a creator who is sort of in charge of things and tells them what to do. And that voice is something that they believe in and trust to actually be the creator on their side and on the side of the good of the universe, right? And the thing is, how do I know that that's true? You know, they have a belief system about how this works that they have a mission assigned to themselves for, and they follow this mission in a very specific kind of way. And for me, that's religion, you know, feeling like you have been called to a certain type of work. Now, I don't really know how that manifests because he's talking about seers and the fact that the seers say, the creator told them X, Y, Z, but there's still there. There's an intermediary that he apparently isn't part of. And so all I have to go on is the fact that he is connected to people who believe that they are talking to the creator. And that's as close as we've really got. And I think in the context of the story, we are meant to believe that what he is saying is actually the truth. But as a reader, I read this and go, says you, you know, because like, this is just the oldest story ever. We're going to go into different lands and we're going to give them the same like values or skills that we have and say that that's for their benefit. And, you know, we're bringing enlightenment or whatever. And while the Incarna did not seem to cause the kind of like wholesale destruction that colonialism does, it's like got some broad strokes vibes to it, you know? And so this story just, it hit sort of weird because I just wasn't expecting any sort of like creator aspect to be part of it. And I should have, I kind of should have, because that's like kind of any time that there's this massive movement movement to do a certain thing that a whole race of people can get behind. It is 
usually motivated by feeling like this is divinely sanctioned somehow, if that makes sense. So, and when later on Jordan winds up meeting the other Incarna who are on the planet, every person, she's just like, oh, yeah, it's no wonder people thought they were gods because, wow, they are, there's a lot going on with these people. They are super beautiful. They just have this, like, intense presence to them. The movements are much more graceful and, like, just not really human. And so, yeah. They were in, they were seen as gods or angels, and he says at one point devils, if we had to be. And then there's the, um, oh my god, I was about to call them the Einher Jar, but that's Dresden Files. Help me, Heather. Heather says I would say it's more spiritual than religious. I don't know. It feels too cohesive to me. When I think of the word spiritual, it feels like sort of vague and just, I have a general precept that I go by, which is do no harm or a uh, golden rule or whatever. But there's like a deity, you know? Um, I don't know. Jenajir. Einher Jar Jenajir. It's no wonder. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and these guys are really deeply... They, as as far as he is concerned, he's like, they are the polar opposite of us. We are striving to create peaceful, united cultures that are mutually supportive. And Jinnajir are like lusting for combat, for discord, for conflict, just in general. And they came in and basically gave the Incarna a smackdown and took over. And I wasn't really aware that it was supposed to be that the Incarna just got beat out. But they're in hiding because of the fact that the Genagir have like put roots down and really like made this place their own. I thought they were hiding because they were trying to keep their influence on the DL, you know, from human beings. I didn't realize that it was like, oh, no, 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 no. Our other, like, you know, our ancient enemy is still here. And so we have to make sure they can't find us and fucking take us out. Um, and this leads to, she doesn't tell him that it's Dr. Linden, but she does say that there is a Jinnajir that is on their side. And, uh, he does not buy this at all. Cassidy is just basically like, mm, okay, look, I know that you're new to this. That's not really how that works. Jinnajir aren't on our side about things because they can't be because their nature is explicitly like this. And she's like, that sounds like racism. Did you bring racism to this planet too? Is that part of your deal? And he seems to be unmoved by her argument. He's very sure he knows how these people work. And she is very sure that his millennia of interaction with these guys has colored his perception, which is probably true. And she doesn't wind up actually telling him who it is. And I think that's a good idea because considering his viewpoint on that, I don't think Lyndon would be safe, you know, but um, I did find it interesting how black and white he sees that because I wasn't really sure it sounded like it was a very absolutist sort of genogeer are bad period. But you know, there might be stories about like somebody breaking away from the pack or doing something, you know, heroic at the last moment, realizing they were wrong, whatever. Nah, doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like it. And I think that's really interesting that like in all this time, there's apparently never been a Jinnajir to break from their tradition and their usual, you know what I mean? So I guess that Lyndon is like really unusual in how he has completely shed any desire for that kind of violence or glory in quotes. Um, 
And I, I just have to assume that it's just the sheer amount of time that has passed, you know, that has caused him to sort of stop and reevaluate. Um, and yeah, exactly. Heather says, at least not that the Incarna know of. And that's what I was going to say is that because so much time has passed, it's possible this has happened to others as well. And he just doesn't know that. And ha- I don't, has Cassidy ever met Professor Lyndon McIntosh or McIntyre, not McIntosh. McIntyre has. And he could not tell what Dr. Lyndon was. Right? So even if Cassidy met Dr. Lyndon, it wouldn't necessarily be a giveaway. Because evidently, it's not like, oh, well, Genogier smell like this, you know? I'm really curious about if they are so familiar with one another, how they keep their natures hidden from each other. And especially curious about the fact that, like, if he doesn't know that Lyndon is a Genogier, how does Lyndon know that Cassidy is an Incarna? How does he have that information? And it's not mutual. Do you know what I mean? Is it just because he has access to like Jordan's blood work and stuff? And so he's like put two and two together or is there some other like source of information that he has? I'm just, I had thought that for sure, if it like, I, I won't say I had thought. What I will say is, if you were to ask me, do you think they would each be able to recognize each other's races if they met? I would assume yes. But it looks like that's not true. And that's surprising. And I just want, wonder how they're able to keep it from one another. Um, I guess just really effective veiling or whatever. Um, so, yeah. He, and he also says like he was pretty young when he was given this mission to like populate earth and he was very excited about the whole concept of it because he was tired of killing. Essentially the role that the Incarna played, what Jordan says eventually is you were like the universe's immune system. So the Incarna were sent to take care of populations that were like causing problems and take them out, like kill entire, you know, basically commit genocide over and over again. And this was again, allegedly due to a divine, like, I I don't know the word I want to use here. I keep thinking of the word syllabus because I'm just thinking about like, oh, here's the list of things that you need to like do for this, this quarter or whatever. But it's the kind of thing that I will take his word for it because I think we're meant to. But if I were hearing this from the outside, this does not sound like what I think he wants it to sound like. It sounds like, you guys were crusaders, you know, and that's not a great look. Um, Regardless though, the whole like assertion here is that they were very glad to do something that promoted life rather than taking it away. And that makes a lot of sense. They were just fucking tired of it, you know? So he took on this assignment with a lot of excitement. And um, he says, uh, let's, oh yeah, here it is. In short, we were created to act as hands for being, for a being that exists as pure energy, as warriors, bringers of order, destroyers of spiritual disease. Um, and he talks about how they, despite coming here to do good, they're like not a perfect species at all. So there have been problems with the ways that things have changed over time um let's see we war had changed us as well we had become less tolerant and more inclined to practicality than belief or faith we made mistakes and i'm like 
you've become less tolerant and you like know that, but also you can't give Jordan the benefit of the doubt that she can recognize an ally versus an enemy in a genogier. Sir, you may want to sit down and try and reconcile those things because it's possible you talking about a lack of tolerance may have something to do with this right now. I'm just saying. Um, and some of, some of us fell into discord drunk with our own power. We were gods among mortals, warlords without peer, and we reveled in the adoration humanity gave us. Humanity fought wars in our name, and we walked amongst them, striking down empires that didn't conform to our plans. What we didn't do was turn on each other. Not even the worst of us would have broken that ancient and sacred rule. And that is really sort of like what's driving, I think, what's coming next. Because there is just an accepted like, yeah, but we're all still in this together, even if we don't agree sort of attitude amongst the Incarna. And it really, <laughs> McIntyre's whole attitude is really giving... I mean, <laughs> you know, because later on, to jump ahead a little bit, he basically is like, okay, so we're going to kidnap the other law sisters. And he frames it as like, no, they're going to become soldiers for us. But they are, I can't remember the names of the, or the um, occupations of each of them. But there's like one that's a cop and the other is like a social worker and there's a chef. The kinds of jobs, like the cop, maybe, but the others, are like very much, they would have no experience in this. This isn't really their fight in the way that he's trying to frame it as. And it's obvious that he's attempting to find a loophole for going against his own people. Like he's trying to behave as if, yeah, well, we'll enlist them in this fight because that's how this goes. And I'm like, okay, no. You want to, you want to get to Jordan a little bit and to Cassidy. I feel like Jordan more so, but you know, Cassidy is just part of that. And the best way to do that is to make it so that she is fighting against her own sisters. You're putting them in danger. It's essentially using hostages as like human shields. So... This whole, we're going to turn them into soldiers, like line that he's trying to use just rings incredibly hollow. This is so transparent. And I'm extremely curious to see how the Incarna react to this, because it crosses a line, in my opinion. It may be adhering to the letter of the law in terms of like, well, you know, we have said that we will bring them into this battle with us eventually. But these girls have not been made aware of what they are yet. Like, as far as I know, Jordan is the only one who knows, right? Jill hasn't found out. Ryan hasn't found out. So they're going to be brought into this in such a way that either he will continue to not inform them of what they are, or he will tell them what they are. And do that like sort of in my opinion this is like something that it's really their father's place to have this conversation with them and he is going to sort of take that away from their dad and that can really foment a kind of distrust between them i mean it's sort of lucky that isn't already what's happened with jordan she's mad at her dad but it's clear that even so underneath that she still trusts him she still has faith in him I don't know what happens if somebody who's like on the opposite side of something with Jordan is the one to come and tell them about all of this. You know, they're not prepared, I don't think. So in my opinion, what McIntyre is doing is not only just incredibly shady and shitty, but I don't think it's as clever as he thinks it is. It's the sort of thing where he's like just so blinded by the situation that he 
is flattering himself that he's cooked up a really creative solution. And it's like, well, I mean, it's just sort of like you trusting that everybody's going to be like, well, there's nothing in the rules that says a dog can't play basketball. And, you know, that's not really how that works, actually, dude. Everybody's going to be able to tell, especially considering what's going on can't be, you know, they're all aware of the clash between him and Jordan, right? So the motivation behind it would feel pretty clear to me. I'm just kind of curious about the Incarna and their interpretation of this kind of rule, because they could be sort of like the spirit of the law, or they could be like the Fae, you know, where it's like, well, okay, like, we that wasn't what we meant when we set this rule, but technically you're still adhering to the rule, so fine. Um, and there are pluses and minuses to writing it either way. You know, it can be fun to see a character try and get around the the rules and find the loopholes, but it can also be really satisfying when it's like, no, the spirit of the thing. They aren't fucking stupid, and they will call you on it. I'm just not really sure which I prefer in this case, honestly. So I'll be interested to see the way that they decide to handle that. Um, so, yeah, he says, uh, a majority of our host was recalled to Incarna space. The war had intensified again and every Incarna was needed. And at one point she says something about why didn't you call for help? And he's like, oh, we did. And they just didn't answer. Um and so we stayed here doing our best until the Genagir essentially took over. Let's see. Okay. And this is when Jordan like mentions the Genagir, um, and knows about like lower caste technicians and the way that they are raised and what they wanted. And he, this is when the whole argument about Linden starts. Um, and it comes down to in the end, Jordan, like, accusing her father of taking McIntyre's side in a conflict about him putting a woman's life on the line for no reason in a way that's just really heartless and that he is forbidding her for getting ret forbidding her from getting retribution for it. And he is like, the guy lost a kid. Like, can can't you understand where he might be coming from? And she's like, I can understand in theory where he might be coming from, but were you in his position? I don't believe that you would just let a woman die because one of your kids had, you know, like she's just like, this is about his personality. This is not about having n no empathy for the situation. And um, for the moment, she agrees that she isn't going to like directly go after McIntyre, but it's just, it's definitely sort of like, well, the timing isn't right anyway, so I'll just sort of like sit on it at the moment. That was the vibe I got anyway. And then we go to the whole thing with um, Othello and Tristan and McIntyre and McIntyre giving them the orders to take the law girls into custody, treating it like it's something that it definitely is not. And low key, like both Othello and Tristan are really unhappy about these orders and they have, they go further than I expected in the scene to make it clear that they don't think this is a good move or a smart move or an ethical move. And essentially McIntyre is like, I'm sorry, who are you? who asked you for anything? Literally nobody here, not a single fucking soul. Get out and do what you're told the way that you are paid to Bye. And I was like, that has to hurt. And it leads to Othello being like, I think maybe we should sign up with Jordan after all, because this just feels really, really wrong to me. And I know that she would take us in despite everything. And Tristan sort of spins a rationalization about how they can keep those sisters, like, because of the escalation of everything, what Tristan says is they are going to be unsafe out there and they don't know how to defend themselves by virtue of what their, you know, their careers are. 
And if they come here, they're going to be safer than they are out there. And for a second, I I almost got a little convinced by that. And then Othello was like, safer? You mean as they're being trained to go out into combat in the open? That kind of safer? That really doesn't sound like a real thing. But if you want to keep telling yourself that, I guess that's your business. And I was like, all right, Othello, you know what? You make a very good point and my bad. Like, he really started to kind of convince me for a second. And it ends with them agreeing to, like, do their best to care, like, to protect these women. But it's clear to me that Othello is really still not happy. And I'm curious on whether he's going to break apart on his own anyway. It feels like he doesn't want to make this move without Tristan. But I kind of think, like, maybe you should just make the move, dude. Like... What McIntyre is failing to sort of see is that when everybody is consistently disagreeing with you this much, you are only as strong as the people beneath you who agree to follow you. And you've already lost most of the most valuable people on your team because you threw away one of their one of their number without a good reason. And you were also outed as a liar and still have not answered for that. And now you're telling them to do something really like just not cool and you're telling them to shut the fuck up and do their job, which is sort of exactly what got you in the situation you are now in. So it just feels like McIntyre is sowing the seeds of mutiny everywhere he goes and he seems blithely unaware of it. Um, so then we have the... Uh, the third chapter where uh, let's see, I'm trying to find, Oh, that right. This starts with Spears. I was going to say that this is the one that starts with, um, Briar young, but basically Spears is just, um, watching Jordan and her progress. And he knows like in general where she is, they are noticing somebody that's following her and he figures out that it's Cassidy. And, um, then he gets off the phone and he picks up, the book Hitlerland, American Eyewitnesses to the Nazi Rise to Power, which is his light afternoon reading, and sits down to just enjoy this and offers to read aloud to Jenna. And she's just like, yeah, I would like that. You haven't done that in a long time. And that is how that scene ends. So then we go to Briar Young. And it turns out he is still with all of the um what is the name of this this group the vodnik they are hiding out in this like bunker it's freezing cold they have these bullshit rations you know i always picture like sort of um those <laughs> those like big industrial sized buckets that they have at like costco that are filled with freeze dried sort of like apocalypse food and the whole thing with Briar throwing in with these guys was because he a wanted to walk on easy street and b wanted to get revenge on Jordan and all of what's going on is not getting him there and he is growing increasingly impatient it's just he's so irritated but the thing is he has an attitude problem about it and he knows that Trechek is not somebody to fuck with. So he is desperately trying to rein that shit in because they can like smell when you're lying. So he has had to figure out how to be sincere while also getting the information that he actually wants without offending them. And what winds up happening here? Cause Trechek is sort of like, look, man, I'll let you get away with some shit because your help is what got us here. And I'm not going to say I don't appreciate that, but you also need to be more fucking respectful, please. This is not going to fly. And prior to his credit, recognizes when he is just out of his league and is like, okay, 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 okay. And then he just says, well, but how long are we going to be here, though? And um, they <laughs> essentially what Trechek says, because Arcady's like, yeah, boss, look, I don't want to get you mad or anything, but like a lot of people have been asking that. 
how long are we going to fucking be here? And Trechak is like, we're going to be here as long as we are going to be here. We are in no shape to go out and try any kind of assault on these people again. Our numbers have been thinned. We are not rested. We don't have any of the resources at the moment that we had. We have got to recuperate, regroup, find new people and bring them in. And that, as you guys know, doesn't always work out. So there's going to be a lot of misfires before we're able to build our ranks up again. So I'm going to need you guys to be patient and trust me and listen to orders because I want us to be built back up to full strength before we try any other shit again. Because currently we're not the predator, we're the prey. And I can't have that. We're not going out like that. And they appear to accept it. But, you know, Briar is like, I feel like Briar just feels this is not really my fight. And so he doesn't want to be stuck here with them. He's just, I think he, (laughs) I think what he pictured happening here, to be honest, was like, I'm going to help you get your, your man out of prison. We're going to get all those dudes somewhere. You're going to hand me an envelope full of cash and be like, Hey, thanks for the help. And I will fucking fuck off to London again with just a pocket full of money while you guys do whatever. Not taking into consideration, you are an outsider with incredibly sensitive information and they can't risk you running around knowing where their headquarters is, how many of them remain, how they manage to break them out. They can't just let you go live your life. Like, what? especially because he faked his own death too. So if he is found and it certainly does not seem like he's careful enough to be, I don't, I don't think anyway, he has managed up to this point, but he felt like he was already verging on doing something stupid because he was sick of hiding. If they found him and figured out like, Oh, you're still alive. You faked your death. They would know probably you did that because you threw in with some bad people, which means that you probably have some information. And guess who they've got? They've got Reggie, who can literally just come on over and read his mind. So it's not even about like, are you loyal or not? Because they don't, it's not about whether he chooses to tell. It's about that they can make him tell. Um, So yeah, he just did not think this through as so many greedy fucking bottom feeders do and he's getting what he deserves and i really enjoy it and i'm i'm sure that there will be a moment where he is sort of like on top again briefly or at least close to it and i'm not looking forward to that but for the moment i'm just enjoying his discomfort and how he's trapped so then we go to this scene where jordan is introduced to all of the Incarna and they're in this like room. It's not specified to us where this room is or how they get there or any of this. I was a little bit like wanting to know just at least, is it someplace that he can get to just by, because she talks about how she called it a teleporter and her father called it the conduit. I'm assuming that's how they got here, but it's not mentioned like where, the other end of it was or if he could just connect to the conduit from wherever he is and that's what i'm sort of curious about and um i can't remember how many of them there are in this scene because it's specifically mentioned a few times how many remain and a chamber of 12 12 12 12 right um and what it is is them deciding whether or not to like officially sanction Jordan, I guess. I will be honest though. I wasn't entirely clear what this meant for her. And I'm not sure if I was meant to know, but why she wants them to acknowledge her other than just sheer validation, which doesn't strike me as a very Jordanish trait was just kind of eluding me are they offering resources or 
are they offering to awaken her? Because she says that she's awakened to her dad. And he's like, no, 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 you're not awakened. You've like reached a point. So is that what it is that like she's if she if they accept her, then she will be able to be awakened and like level up, essentially, if that's it, I totally get it. Um, and that felt like kind of what he was implying, but I just want to make sure that I'm getting that right. And and the way that they determine whether or not she's ready is by watching the fight in New York. And I was sort of interested in the fact that they choose this fight in particular. I'm not sure why this is the one that they decide to use as their example, but overall, the whole fight and the the ferocity of it impresses pretty much everybody the only person who does not vote for her is mcintyre which is not surprising um sorry and my nose is itching um heather says because if they acknowledge her it means that mcintyre can't actively come after her and there are abilities and knowledge she doesn't have yet Oh, I didn't think about that he can't actively come after her. But then she can't actively come after him either. I mean, I know her dad had said you can't. And she was like, all right, fine for now. But if she's agreeing to this, then she's essentially like, all right, well, then I'll find a different way to do this. And that's interesting. I didn't think about that. And there are abilities and knowledge she doesn't have yet makes sense. That was sort of where I was like, but I just... It wasn't that specific. So I was, you know, um, and yeah, she watches this like sort of highlight reel of that fight and experiences it in real time. Like it's all happening all over again. It's not like thinking about a memory and remembering Oh, yeah, he made me like super horny for him. That was weird. No, she's feeling the desire in the moment like it's it's happening now again. Um, And so, yeah, all of them are basically like, wow, that was pretty impressive, actually. Goddamn. OK, yeah, I think that you're ready. And he's the only one who's like, no. Nah. So sucks to suck because nobody agrees with you, sir. And um, it ends, there's like a couple back and forth with a couple of the different Incarna, like there's an Asian dude who's like sort of joking around, or maybe it's Native American guy. Um, there's with this like redhead who, there. It, there's obviously like a little bit of affection and she feels how aloof they are initially, but once she's accepted their attitude just changes so dramatically and she feels really welcomed by them. Um, and it ends with McIntyre saying, it has been decided. Let the song of life tell the tale of Jordan, daughter of Cassidy, daughter of Shauna and her final journey as a child. She will be known to all from this day forward as her own woman. And uh, it ends with, her mother singing because they use music as a means of like conjuring this flashback memory highlight reel kind of thing. Um, and I'm always a fan of using sound for essentially magic. You know, I think it's something that doesn't get used that much because it's difficult to write, but I think it's a neat concept considering how affecting I find music in real life. And that's why I often don't listen to it because it's too affecting and I resent it. So, yeah, so that is the end of the chapter. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to wrap up, but thank you again, Heather, for commissioning this. I'm excited to be starting this book. And I hope that you guys are enjoying the coverage. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.